Welcome to Tag Talk, your source for opinions and discussion on the Nerf hobby and community. I'm Jangular, and with me again is Walcom S7. How's it going, Walcom? It's going pretty good, buddy. How about you? I am still glad we're doing this. The last one was fun. Hopefully this one will be just as fun. So for those of you that missed the first one, the concept of this show is we have a topic. I know it. You know it. Walcom doesn't know it. So we're going to get his fresh opinions on it, and we will have a discussion. Pretty relaxed, pretty fun, and uh, let's just get right on into it. So today, our topic is, should Nerf be pay to play? And I'll let you go ahead and let your mind run with that and see what your first thought is. There's a few different scales you can go with. There's the local game, there's kind of the mid-sized game where you rent a location, and then there's big events, you know, national level events. So... It may be varying answers for this, but it's worth discussing. Oh, God. I, this might cause an actual firestorm because <laughs> you got to remember that I got my, obviously, you know, bedroom backyard plinking with foam darts has been a thing for quite some time. And that's where most of us get our start. But for me, my big thrust into the community was a place called Dart Zone, later known as Dart Wars, which was a basically a laser tag arena, but for Nerf, you could walk in, pay a fee, you either rent a blaster, they give you a jolt for starters, but you could rent a better blaster or you could bring your own and they supplied the ammo. But of course the main point there is you had to pay to get in and you had to pay per hour, which was probably the worst part about it. However, for me, it was great because all I had to do was go there pay 15 bucks and I got to play for like two hours and didn't have to worry about scheduling a game or if people showed up or not. It was basically public matchmaking for Nerf. You play Call of Duty, you hit the mode you want to play, you wait for four seconds, then you're in a match. It was kind of the same thing. Nowadays, uh, things are getting kind of tricky, aren't they? It's a different, it's a different kind of atmosphere in terms of what people expect out of events. Now, I think it's reasonable to go to a, you know, retail location and pay for their space since they are providing a service. That is, I think, very reasonable and something I wish we had more of, to be honest, because yeah. the concept of just being able to go to a location on a weeknight and get some Nerf in, fantastic. Love it and was legitimately kind of envious of the fact that you had one near you, though the more you talked about it and, <laughs> and I heard the stories from you and all that, well, uh, the less it was um, as in The great question of if that worked is, hey, are you still going there or would you still be going there? And the answer is probably no. Yeah. Uh, uh, honestly, they had some issues there and they never really seemed to fix them. And that's such a disappointing thing because it's such a cool model and such an interesting thing that they focused on kids, obviously, which, you know, makes sense given the expected demographic of... You the, gotta make you money. Know, yeah. But I feel like you should look into the adult side of it to cater to... I mean, look at Detroit Dart Club. Like, a lot of their yeah, parties no, are I've for adults. So, and that's... It's one of those age-old things where when you market something to kids, that's your bottom line. That's what you're going to get there. But the weirdest thing, because we grew up in the 90s and stuff, you know this just as well as I do, when you market something for like older teenagers and stuff like that, kids think it's just as cool, if not even cooler. Absolutely. That's why they always aim to have the models on the toy boxes be a little bit older than the people they're marketing to. It's just, it's how they do things. Uh, so yeah, I, and really most of us in this hobby, we're big kids. Like, that's fun. Who doesn't want to be a big kid? I love it. A lot of people love it. And so having things that don't need to be catered to us entirely, because as you said, it's the bottom line. Getting those kids parties and the kids in and out and all that, that's huge. That is super important. But having a couple nights a week where you really kind of go into the adult side of things and not even necessarily adult, but teen and up and, you know, modded blasters. And uh, of course, I would love to see competitive nights who, let's be real, who watching this video right now hasn't dreamed of opening up their own private like Nerf Arena business. And that know, was literally my like entire point of starting my channel. Like, yeah. If I ever make a substantial amount of money doing what I do, 
that's this that is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I want a Nerf arena that I can toy with the layout, I can toy with the game modes, I can have it evolve along with the ecosystem and the hobby, and I want to make it the coolest place you can play this game. Because of course, uh, my as you probably know this because I think it inspired you to watch the series, but Gundam Build Fighters was like, yes, this is it. This is what oh, I yeah. want. This is Nerf and it needs to happen at some point. And Absolutely. you actually made that a reality, which is the scariest part of that. Now all we need to have is Jangular's fun house. And oh, man. Everything's all well and good. Don't get me wrong. I actually, like, a couple years back, maybe more than that, I looked at land prices, how much it would cost to rent a facility, and started trying to put together a business plan for something that could be kind of a central hub for games and and whatnot beyond just like the weekly stuff that you know the kids bottom line etc cetera, etc cetera, but be a place for larger events and tournaments and stuff like that and of course being in the bay area it's prohibitively expensive so yeah unless i magically won the lotto or uh, had a excessively successful run on youtube um would not be feasible uh but the idea of having that location, having a pro shop where you could, you know, bring your blaster to have it fixed, tinkered on, upgraded if you aren't comfortable with stuff. The latest gear is there and available. Um, I personally am a little kind of uh, fixated on the pro shop because uh, I don't know if I've talked about this, but I grew up in a bowling alley. Uh, my dad Ooh. owned a, a pro shop in a bowling alley. So I spent my youth in a bowling alley seeing my dad work on other people's things and and like fine tune them and make them better and stuff. So like to me that just, there's something fantastic about that. So having that kind of be available uh, for our hobby is kind of like a pipe dream type thing. Like we aren't there yet, but someday I, I would it's love to see that. It's getting bigger every year. Yeah. More and more people are entering the hobby. More and more YouTube channels are popping up. All these communities are getting bigger and bigger around this entire hobby. And with the push that companies like Dart Zone are doing, where they're putting out like Dart Zone Pro, which is meant for people like us to a degree. And if like, God help us, Hasbro ever jumps in on that, this Damn. hobby could explode because I very much believe this hobby is capable of standing toe to toe with like Airsoft and Paintball, if not higher because of the high amount of customization that you can do in this hobby. The customization and the... Uh availability in terms of play space are two of the big things that this hobby has going for it. Now, uh, the, the topic of airsoft and paintball is a whole different thing that we can get into another time. Believe me, it's on the list. Oh, I'm just uh, teasing it. I yeah, knew that was coming I, at some point. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there's plenty we can get into there, but the reality is we're still growing. Like we're still in the infancy of this hobby. So there's a ton that we can do still. Uh, and that is... Which leads us right back around to yes, your question. Exactly. At the bottom level, is is ner is it okay for Nerf to pay to play? And let's start with basically tier one, the wars that like we put on up here with the Borst Wars and stuff like that, where we just put it up on Facebook that we're going to a park and we're doing this thing. Should we pay for those? In my opinion, I think there should be a certain amount of money that goes towards that because you've got a lot of people that don't play that sit around and just referee. And even then that shouldn't really matter, but it's the upkeep that these people are also doing. They're supplying darts, props. I know I had to buy a megaphone and stuff like that because we just didn't have one. And I was tired of my voice getting worn out and stuff like that. I've bought props and stuff for game modes in the past. And over time, yes, the club has built this up to a degree, but I mean, when we started, that wasn't a thing. And some of us were, you know, throwing $30, 40 into this thing, building up our club. And it would be great if, like, if somebody showed up that we had, like, fresh ammo and stuff for them and we could afford to do stuff like that as long as it stays within the hobby. I know for a fact that we did at one point have a Indiegogo or a GoFundMe or something huh. that all of us chipped into to make sure that we had the money to rent out a place for us to play. Right, right, right. So... Yeah, we've done similar in terms of, well, not quite the same, but we've taken a different route. Um, we don't necessarily always want to force people to pay because sometimes exactly. people, you know, don't really have the few bucks to spare or they don't yeah, really want exactly. to. Or, so we'll go with things like, you know, donations or 
uh, optional dart rental fees. So like if you bring your own darts, you're good. If you want to use ours, it's like three bucks, something like that. So there's kind of options and a variety of way to do it because the reality is, as you mentioned, there's a lot of costs to running a Nerf group and people may or may not be aware of it, but it's not just replenishing darts at times. It's, you know, uh, field supplies, cones, uh, like you mentioned, a megaphone to be able to have people hear you, which is nice at times, uh, cover pieces, all kinds of kind of intangibles and stuff that you may not immediately think of. So that is something that you kind of have to consider. And uh, for us kind of on that topic of renting places, we took last year for our uh, uh, Barrier Foam Sports League, which is our BTA league here, we took our fees that we had taken from like dart rentals and stuff like that throughout the course of the year and put that towards renting an indoor facility for a winter game. So it didn't cover all of it, but the money that people put in helped go for that. So it's kind of like a you're paying to help the group stay healthy. It's not like you're paying to profit or to be someone else's profit, but you're paying for the community to be better. And that kind of, to me, is the foundation of it. Like, I'm not opposed, as I said earlier, to a retail space or an indoor location or something that's like a business having a revenue from it. That's fine. I The concept, as a side note here, the concept of people making their livings off of this hobby is wonderful to me because that to me says that we're growing at a rate that is fantastic and we can support ourselves. So that's side tangent. Don't want to get too far into that, but yes, I think uh, as long as it's not going into profit, then it can be a really good thing at that low level. So I'm almost torn on that concept too, because a lot of times like, and this, this varies from place to place, person to person, but uh, let's say an event like Ragnar Oktoberfest, I don't really know a whole lot about anything that goes on right there, but for the people who were, you know, volunteering, helping out and stuff like that, when they were just standing there watching everybody else play, maybe they weren't into it themselves. Maybe they were play people who wanted to play that knew they had to work to get that event to even happen. I almost don't mind paying people like that a little bit of money just to make it, you know, somewhat worth their time. Like you got to have referees, you got to have people running the game and to expect the same people to run the game every single time and not play that can be kind of disastrous in a lot of scenarios. So yes, I'm fully, I don't really want people to like be mass profiting like, yeah, $10 dart rentals. I'm going to go buy, you know, PlayStation three after right. this game or something like that. But I also don't mind, Hey, you know, do you want to referee and make like 20 bucks for the day? I was yeah. Like, yeah, dude, that pays for my dinner. And I don't really want to run around right now. I'll volunteer for four or five hours and get this game going. Yeah. And that's a like, huge, I don't mind that at all. That's a huge thing. Is it, if it's someone, something's doing to try it like a, as like a hustle, uh, that's one thing. If it's like their business and they are again, providing a service, then yeah, make a living off of it. Um, but if it's a volunteer, getting them supported and making them feel, you know, thanked is super important. Uh, we definitely paid the refs at Ragnar Oktoberfest, uh, the for God their hope. time. Um, <laughs> like, what was that? I didn't hear you. I God hope so. Cause I was like, yeah. the lady I was sitting there, cause I was just, you know, watching a corner and not doing anything. And I was kind of standing next to her, just, you know, talking to her and it's like, Hey, what do you think about all this stuff? And, you know, it's just like, you know, as long as you're okay with it and having fun and, Hopefully you're making money and stuff like that. I don't really know, but it's like I she stood there for hours yeah. with like a little 3D printed scanner, and it's like, dude, I would I, that would suck. Yeah, like, it, it's that's and that's crush me. <laughs> I would I would love the the reality is a lot of volunteers don't get paid. Like we don't have the budget for it. Of and, course, and, that's, and Ragnar Toberfest posts the budget, so like the refs for five v five got paid for their time which is fantastic and because they were paintball referees that we brought in so that they would have no kind of community knowledge or kind of bias. We wanted people that were just fresh and, and like experienced in refereeing. So paintball refs seemed like a great idea. Yeah. Um, there's room for improvement, of course, always, but don't want to get too far into that because we're talking about payment and I, I agree go... completely with you that I don't, I don't want some little kid to show up, you know, 11, 12 years old, 
you know, he's got a, a Maverick or something like that. He wants to play. I don't want him to have to pay money. I don't even want him to have to pay a dart rental fee or anything like yeah. that. It kind of depends on a person to person basis, but I want people to just show up and play. I know that I was told for like from Ragnar Oktoberfest, sorry to keep beating a horse, but no. with Ragnar Oktoberfest, some people were mad. They had to pay like the what five, ten dollars to get in. They thought it was a free event and they were upset about that. And I'm sitting here like I would rather pay at an event, any event that I go to, I would like to pay twenty, twenty-five dollars or you know, what I have different levels or something that I can pay into in order to like make sure that the game is fun. Like yeah. that's my most important thing. It's like I'm not saying you can't have fun with no money just shooting around people at a you know with friends at a public Absolutely. park or something like that. But when you can have money to have people ref and buy props and do all this crazy stuff and throw an insane game like Ragnar Oktoberfest. Yeah. Money is kind of important. And to expect like just a handful of people to bankroll that for hundreds is kind of crazy to me. It's, and that's kind of something I wanted to put into perspective. Like our, the, one of the first major events we had was end war, which yeah. is free for entry, yeah. which is amazing. I love that. I think it's fantastic. But I don't want that necessarily to become the expectation. I don't want that to be the standard because the reality is not every event has the funding to be able to self-fund. And that's kind of a strange sentence to say, but I think the point gets across. Not every major event can afford to do everything out of their own pockets. It's the unfortunate fact of it. And for us to continue to see more of the, these major events happen, a fee for entry is not a terrible thing. Like this is a major event where people are flying from literally across the world. I don't like to use the word <laughs> literally, but really it was across the world. The other side of the world, people are flying to come to these events. Five, 10 bucks is not unreasonable. I don't think. No, it costs, you know, just for me to fly to Georgia for end war, the plane ticket, both ways was like six hundred and eighty. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, it was not cheap. And then you're not, and then hotel fees, car rental yeah. fees. Because you got to have a car. I got to have a way to get all of my stuff from the airport to the hotel and from the hotel to the event. That's not cheap. It's hard to even fathom how this happens. For I don't. Some people I don't even know how they do it because like everybody's cutting corners somewhere. Right. Some people I know cut a lot of corners, sleeping in vans and driving for thirty, Respect forty to hours. Them. Yeah, it's insane. Uh, you but are stronger I, than I. I have a thing that just popped up in my head that I'm going to throw at you like a curveball. And I want right. to know what your opinion on this is as the final coup de grace to this entire thing. What do you think about almost some kind of pay to win mechanic in a game like, let's say, End War? What if you could pay money for an extra life or a power up or something like that, that doesn't necessarily break the game. But if you didn't want to be a zombie or if you wanted to be a zombie, but you wanted to be a spitter or if you wanted to be, you know, all this kind of stuff, should people be allowed to pay for stuff like that? My immediate instinct is no. Okay. I just, I, I, I think I get the point you're, you're going towards where like you can do it where it's not necessarily game breaking exactly yeah but because there's so many ways to go about it. the the potential problem i see with that is it could reinforce the stigma that being a zombie player is losing no i know so players. many people well right. there, there are people there's who plenty go of there people just to use their blasters and yeah. there are people who go there just to use their blasters they get extremely upset when they get tagged there's also people that just walk into the horde they get their oh, yeah. two or three hours of running around they get tired and they're like screw this i want to go tag some humans i want to sit against a pillar like this wait for some schmuck to walk by and just walk out and just tag him and be like hey you're a zombie now no. It happened Here's to me so my... many times at Ragfest when I was not in game. This this is side tangent again. We're talking about it real quick. My interpretation of HVZ is a glorious death simulator. It yeah. is it is like that is what you should be striving. Okay, I shouldn't say that necessarily. That's what I'm striving for every time I play it because I'm not gonna survive the entire time. Odds are, so I want to have a good story out of it. Something that I'm like, I went up against a horde of forty zombies, took out thirty eight of them, and the last two got me. You know, like some crazy over the top story 
that I can have as a memory of that game. That's what I want out of HVZ. I don't need to survive the entire time. And being a zombie player, super interesting. Like you're all about stealth and like trying to read players and manipulate a situation so that you can get a player in a certain spot and get that tag. How many people would take to coordinate that? So there's so many things that go into playing zombies. That you can it, have so much more fun as a zombie. Yes. Dude, you think like you're, you're like, I don't want, I just want to shoot zombies and I want to survive and be the last survivor. I don't know about you, but I get super tired after like two hours of like constantly being on edge, looking around and doing all that kind oh, of stuff. It that wears on you. Once I've had my fun, I just want to go, okay, you know what? I'm done. Make me a zombie. I'm going to go out in some stupid way. I'm going to sprint into the horde and just spray everything down until I'm dead. Do something like that. Because once I'm a zombie, it's basically just like, all right, how are we going to do this? If I got my friends or my friends are still human, I'm going to make it my sole mission <laughs> to make them zombies. Because when we're zombie posse, oh my God, we're going to set up kill zones. We're going to have so much fun. And it's just that it's, it's like playing an MMO with like full loot PVP yes. or something. You're literally just going to be stabbing people as they walk through the door and stealing all their stuff almost. Yeah, it's, it's that it's kind glorious. of mentality as opposed to running for your life. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. I will play as hard as I can to survive, but if it's clear that things are not going to go my way, I'm not going to like try and fight it and, you know, do something wild to get out of it. No, I'm going to embrace it and have it be glorious because it's a game. It's not yeah. reality. It's a game and it is fun. So yeah, that was, uh, that was an interesting side tangent to send. Um, yeah, I, I just I wanted think... to, because I, I would almost, because there are some people that get really upset about yes. it. I wouldn't mind if you could go like, hey, hey, you want to play again? 15 bucks, I'll make you a human again. That's an interesting and, like, concept. Like some people, some people would be like, yeah, because those kind of people, like it's almost like they're just going to get tagged out again anyway. You know what I mean? So oh, like, I, don't, I don't know how that would, like, I don't see a downside to that, but I get what, I don't want the stigma. I'm like, oh, you can. Right. You're There's, cheating the game by paying. It's devaluing the entire game. I can see that going on. There's some too. interesting kind of nuance to that, I suppose. But I think this is where we ask all of you what you think on this topic. We started with, should Nerf be pay to play? And we kind of meandered into a little bit of uh, HVZ How discussion. How far can you go? So, <laughs> this may become a common theme on this series where we start with one thing and end somewhere else, but I'm totally okay with that. But as always, let us know down in the comments, are we foolish? Are we on the right track? Did we forget something? I want to hear from Definitely all of you. foolish. Well, we, we know that. On the right track. I hope for that one, at least. But if you're enjoying these so far, let us know. Hit that subscribe button so you can catch all of them in the future. Thank you so much, Walcom, for being here. I'm loving having you on this show, and I'm glad we're doing I it. I love being here. So with that, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time. See you in an entirely different one.